Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you for stopping by, as always. Let me start by first thanking uh, Kamal Santa Maria of Al Jazeera for having me on his very dynamic Al Jazeera news grid show about connecting uh, Djibouti to Dakar uh, by rail. Um, something that I'm very constructive about. I think, um, you know, most of Africa's exports go off the continent and this connection point east-west is going to, I think, be a catalyst for intra-African trade on that axis. Um, take a look at the MindSpeak question and answer session with Eric Solheim and Sander Ojiambo, which we've just also published. My piece over the weekend uh, starts like this. Wikipedia has an article on Hallison Days, and it reads thus. From Latin Alcyone, daughter of Ayunus and the wife of Sex. When her husband died in a shipwreck, Alcyone threw herself into the sea whereupon the gods transformed them both into Hallison birds, kingfishers. When Alcyone made her nest on the beach, waves threatened to destroy it. Aeolus restrained his winds and kept them calm during seven days in each year, so she could lay her eggs. These became known as the Hallison days when storms do not occur. Today, the term is used to denote a past period that is being remembered for being happy and or successful. The markets worldwide exited its Hallison days on Friday. Stephen King, author of horror, supernatural fiction, suspense, science fiction and fantasy, tweeted, How much did the Dow drop today? 666 points. Let me say it again. 666. Coincidence, I think not. The fear index, the VIX, jumped by 30% to the highest level since 2016. US Treasury yields reached fresh highs last week, with the 10-year yields surpassing 2.8%, and the 30-year bond yield rising above 3 for the first time in 8 months. The US 10-year yield is the go-to pricing mechanism for all the dollar borrowing worldwide. Borrowing rates are climbing in the United Kingdom and in Europe. Yadeni told Bloomberg that the bond market had been rigged by central banks for nearly 10 years and that this was now reversing in the United States. Yardini was referring to the quantitative easing programs where central banks print currency, buy their own country's bonds in order to suppress interest rates and stimulate their economies. QE programs which had injected lashings and lashings of liquidity into the markets, like a great golden flood of liquidity, QE is believed to have inflated market valuations as far as emerging, frontier, sovereign sub-Saharan African, and even cryptocurrency markets, which I will get to momentarily, and which endured a bloodbath on Friday. Interestingly, JP Morgan's MB spread is down to 258 basis points, the tightest since mid-2014. How long this lasts is anybody's guess. Emerging and frontier market borrowers surely need to get their skates on and pull the trigger real quick on any borrowing they've been considering for this year. Dr. Muriel Rubini, who called the 2008 market crash, said Bitcoin is the mother of all bubbles and its bubble is now bursting in an interview on Bloomberg Television. He said virtually every group of 20 countries, a group of 20 countries is talking about cracking down on the phenomenon as policymaker worries grow. Bitcoin dropped as much as 16% to 7,643. It's right now just above 8,000. 
then rebounded to 9,150 on Sunday before tumbling again and we're back now just above 8,000. Bitcoin tumbled 21% during the week, other crypto coins rippled, Ether, Litecoin tumbled at least 28% as the asset class got engulfed in an orgy of selling. Caveat, mTOR, folks. Edwin Lefebvre's reminiscences of a stock operator remains a go-to book for many, said the tape is your telescope. Next week, I suspect many folks will be pulling out their telescopes this week, and peering ever so closely at a whole series of tapes. This week's bond massacre in one chart, US 10-year yields jumped to 2.85%, higher since January 2014. Bond yields closed at 0.76%, highest level since September 2015. Go back to September 2016 when I wrote Mirrors on the Ceiling, the Pink Champagne on Ice. And what I said then is applying now. If volatility spikes, positions are going to be reduced en masse. Or to put it another way, and to borrow the lyrics from the Eagles' Hotel California, Mirrors on the Ceiling, the Pink Champagne on Ice. And she said, we are all just prisoners here of our own device. Last thing I remember, I was running for the door. I had to find the passage back to the place I was before. Relax, said the nightman, we are programmed to receive. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. This morning, the US 30 years blasted through 3.1%. This is David Inglis. The end of complacency on Wall Street fear index fix jumps by 30% to the highest level since 2016. The Dow plunged to 666 points. Nouriel Roubini is interviewed in this link um, where he calls Bitcoin the mother of all bubbles and its bubble is now bursting. This was from Saturday, another wild ride for Bitcoin. We're currently at 8,100. I like this tweet from Trader Dante. I keep telling this idiot at the Lamborghini dealership that this is just a pullback in Bitcoin. There's no need to repossess my car. 27th of November was when I turned bearish and in fact we rallied a lot further and I said Bitcoin, wow, what a ride. It is a curve each of them feels unmistakably, it is the parabola. They must have guessed once or twice, guessed and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape latent in the sky. That shape of no surprise, no second chance, no return. 2nd of January, I put out another sell order. I'm no longer bullish Bitcoin, I said, in fact, I'm bearish. Home thoughts, soak up the Friday glow at Serena Zanzibar. We stayed there many years ago. It's in just on the edge of Stone Town. Wise words from Malala, I think it's pointless to be hopeless. If you are hopeless, you waste your present and your future. Marshall McLuhan, Digital Prophecies, the medium is the message. I've been listening to that again, and I think it's very consequential to the world we live in today. Interstellar, the bizarre visitor from a far-off solar system, new scientist, came across this, we examined the possibility that fast radio bursts, FRBs, originate from the activity of extragalactic civilizations. You'd have a read. Very interesting indeed. In this letter we examined the possibility that FRBs are artificial beams which have been set up as beacons or for driving light sails. The idea that extraterrestrial civilizations may be using radio beams manifested as dispersed pulses is certainly not a new one. 
as it dates back to the pioneering paper by Cocconi and Morrison. Took me back to that article I wrote in December 2016. We have a deviate tomahawk. The specialist who is monitoring data on his mission console. When a voice breaks in, a voice that carried with it a strange and unspecifiable poignancy. He checks in with his flight dynamics and conceptual paradigm officers at Colorado Command. We have a deviate tomahawk. We copy, there's a voice. We have gross oscillation here. There's some interference. I've gone redundant, but I'm not sure it's helping. We're clearing an outframe to locate source. Thank you, Colorado. It is probably just selective noise. You are negative red on the step function quad. It was a voice, I told them. We have just received an affirm on selective noise. We will correct Tomahawk. In the meantime, advise you to stay redundant. The voice, in contrast to Colorado's metallic pigeon, is a melange of repartee, laughter and song, with a quality of purest, sweetest sadness. Somehow, we are picking up signals from radio programs of 40, 50, 60 years ago. Andy Warhol turned out his black rhinoceros as part of the 1983 endangered species. This is his black rhinoceros. And also, take a look at my two male rhinos, the real life ones that I came across at Lower. Miguel Chevalier installs generative interactive VR tapestries on massive scales. Enjoy his magic carpets of 2014 inside Casablanca, Morocco's Sacre Coeur Cathedral. Finally, enjoy these snowy landscapes captured digitally by Japanese phot photographer Fuke and subjectively filled in with colours representing the artist's emotions. Political Reflections, what it's like to live in a surveillance state, New York Times. Imagine that this is your daily life while on your way to work or on an errand every hundred meters you pass a police blockhouse. Video cameras on street corners and lampposts recognize your face and track your movements. At multiple checkpoints, police officers scan your ID card, your irises, and the contents of your phone. <coughs> At the supermarket or the bank, you are scanned again. Your bags are x-rayed and an officer runs a wand over your body, at least if you are from the wrong ethnic group. Members of the main group are usually waved through. The personal information, along with your biometric data, resides in a database tied to your ID number. The system crunches all of this into a composite score that ranks you as safe, normal or unsafe. Based on these categories, you may or may not be allowed to visit a museum, pass through certain neighborhoods, go to the mall, check into a hotel, rent an apartment, apply for a job, or buy a train ticket. Or you may be detained to undergo re-education, like many thousands of other people. A science fiction dystopia? No. This is life in northwestern China today, if you're an Uyghur. And I wrote about this in November 2017. I tweeted about it. I said Xinjiang is a laboratory experiment in control and surveillance. An interesting article called The Point of Sharp Power in Pro Syndicate. And uh, this is talking about how uh, China and Russia managed to advance their power without really utilizing soft power. The analytical trap is to assume that authoritarian governments which suppress political pluralism and free expression in order to maintain power at home would be inclined to act differently internationally. These regimes have shrewdly adopted some of the forms but not the substance of soft power. What they pursue is better understood as sharp power whose key attributes are outward facing censorship manipulation and distraction, rather than persuasion and attraction. Saying information warfare also forms a part of the authoritarian's repertoire. And I said the level of Russian intrusion into the US political sphere is a preeminent example of sharp power in my point of 
view. What happens when China eclipses the US in Asia? Contrary to what you might read or hear, President Trump alone hasn't surrendered US strategic leadership in Asia to China. What he has done is to accelerate long-term trends that have severely diminished America's position in the Western Pacific, an area where the US has held sway largely unchallenged since World War II. The era of primacy is close to an end. In fact, the US strategic position is eroding so quickly that even sharing the region with China isn't really a valid option any longer, argues Hugh White, a professor at the Australian National University in Canberra. America's allies in Southeast Asia and Australia say they don't want to choose between the US and China. But underneath those platitudes, nobody in the region wants to make an enemy of Beijing. All the more so because officials increasingly doubt the US will be there in the end, according to White. Clearly, China and America face an economic equivalent of mutually assured destruction for each side. The economic consequences of a rupture are so immense as to be almost unthinkable. But that doesn't mean that one side or the other would never be tempted to risk a confrontation if they come to believe that the other side would blink first. This seems to be what Beijing now assumes, which is why it has been so assertive in recent years. Beijing believes that America will blink first to avert a crisis because its interest in Asia is, in the long run, less important than China's, and I think they're probably right. That goes back to what I was writing in my article, China Rising, when I said China's parabolic rise has been simply breathtaking. I was talking about OBOR, a program that binds the world to Beijing because all the roads and railways have but one destination, and that is China. Um, I was talking about not a unipolar world, not even a bipolar world, but a tripolar world. I said, apart from a few half-hearted and timid phonots, China has established control over the South China Sea. It has created artificial islands that militarize those artificial islands across the South China Sea. It is a mind-boggling geopolitical advance any which way you care to cut it. China has advanced its footprint in Pakistan, where it has leased the Gwadar port. Uh, for 43 years, Sri Lanka, which gorged on Chinese debt, has had to disgorge the Hamban Tota port to its creditor. Recently, we saw China open a facility in Djibouti. These moves taken together speak to a material Chinese advance. The pivot to Asia, which was supposed to contain China, is dead in the water, and China sprung that trap. I was also talking about how China seemed to be surrounding India and goading Narendra Modi. And I still think that's the case. They've tweeted, Obor China's tweeted an image of Gwadar Port. The president is tweeting that the FBI influenced the election he won. Point. Thanks, Nunes, for reminding everyone that a guy who has been under investigation since 2013 for being a Russian asset somehow found his way to become a top foreign policy advisor for Trump. Al Waleed posted this photograph of himself, and of course, this is uh, in, he has been released. Uh, Reuters got the first interview. Uh, read the Reuters backstory to Katie Paul's exclusive interview with Saudi Prince Al Waleed in his luxury prison. Maldives army surrounds Parliament. Jaysh al Nasser released clearer footage of the shooting down of a Russian jet over Idlib. Pilot reportedly found without a parachute, died fighting on the ground apparently. After an offensive, seven Turkish soldiers died in Syria. Macron had been sentenced Turkish officials by saying in a newspaper interview last week that France would have a real problem with the campaign if it turned out to be an invasion operation. Corbyn waits for the drop as Tory leaders and remains push made to the age, writes Adam Bolton in the Sunday Times. Let's move on to the markets. As I said, the Adeni says the bond market is rigged, has been rigged by the central banks for nearly 10 years. I believe that is now normalizing. Recent bond market sell-off in a historical perspective, that's via Deutsche Bank and Tracy Alloway. 
currency markets, euro 124.58, dollar index 89.19, Japanese yen, which topped 110, 109.95, Swiss franc 0.09310, the pound 141.18, the Australian dollar, which topped 0.81 a few days back, is now at 0.7932. India would be 64.13, South Korea 110, 89.15, the Rial 3.2190, Egyptian pound 17.6580, and the Rand back above 12 because of the strong dollar at 1203.55. Dollar index, I think we can expect to rebound. You noticed I was getting a bit nervous that we weren't going to hit 88, so I think we go long here. Euro dollar. Um, Bam Bam Finance, from which this chart is received, is looking for it to go lower. UK 10-year bond yield now at 1.56%, the highest since April 2016. Uh, Stephen King, how much did the Dow drop today? 666 points. Let me say it again, 666 points. Coincidence, he asks. This is another Dow Jones chart. Brent crude. Most people think this is now topping out at $67.80. Remember, the target was 17 We struck that. Gold, 1330.75 uh, trading has come off a little bit. U.S. bond deals are spiking higher, but emerging market sovereign debt is not selling off. Um, J.P. Morgan's MB spread is down to 258 basis points, the tightest since mid-2014. ISS today, a wind of change blows through Southern Africa. It was an eventful 2017 for the Southern African region, the end of an era it seemed as political dinosaurs shuffled off the stage. In September, Angola President Jose Eduardo dos Santos stepped down after 38 years in power. He was re replaced by Defence Minister Hao Lorenzo. In November, Zimbabwean strongman Robert Mugabe was eased out of State House by a military assisted transition after 37 years at the helm and replaced by his former Deputy President Emerson Mangagwa, whom he had just fired. And in December, South, South, South African President Jacob Zuma also confronted him in a political eclipse. His plans to control the ANC from the outside were thwarted by his Deputy Cyril Ramaphosa edging out his anointed ex-wife, Dlamani Tsuma, in the party's presidential elections. These events raised important questions. Would the successors offer more of the same, since they were from the same ruling party as their predecessors? Um, Angola, which was finally isolated, must reconnect with the global economy, its foreign minister, Augusto, told Le Monde in an interview. Ramaphosa, meanwhile, though not yet South Africa's president, has already begun to flex his muscles through the ANC, pushing Zuma to appoint a long-delayed judicial commission of inquiry into the state capture by Zuma's business cronies. Lorenzo, Mangaga, Ramaphosa all made star turns at last week's World Economic Forum in Davos, visibly signaling re-entry to the global community. It was the first ever visit to this gathering of the global business elite by an Angolan president. Both Mnangagwa and Lorenzo then went on to the African Union summit in Addis Ababa. While Mugabe had been a regular at AU summit, Dos Santos had not attended since 2010. Will this go beyond curbing corruption and reforming economies? Are these measures pragmatically and deliberately intended by the former liberation movements, FLMs as they call themselves, just to ensure they remain in power? Is this really only about modernizing FLM domination? Or are we likely to see far-reaching reforms that truly open up the political space for opposition parties and create the real possibility that the FLMs might actually lose and concede power in the foreseeable future. Angolan activist Rafael Marquez, who heads the NGO Maca Angola, is unimpressed by Lorenzo, who he dismisses as the Dos Santos Redux, suggesting the new guard has just jostled the old one out to get its own snout in the cloth. What good is it to find an extremely corrupt official if he or she gets to keep the loot, he asks.
Piers Pingu, Southern African expert at the International Crisis Group, says it's too soon to say whether a fresh breeze is blowing through the region or the FLMs are just figuring out joint survival strategies for maintaining their divine right to rule in more effective ways. 29th of January, I wrote a piece about Davos and an outstanding investor relations effort out of Southern Africa, which dealt with this. What was the biggest reservoir in the system, the Waters Kloof Dam, has almost has mostly evaporated or been sucked dry. End of the road, Zuma faces attack on all sides. However, Malema says Zuma is refusing to resign. ANC can only remove Zuma through NEC recall or a motion in Parliament. And everyone's getting saying it's going to be a historical week. South African oil shares down 1.42% year to date. The dollar versus rand back above 12, 12.0355. Television personality Mini Dlamini and Olympic gold med medalist Usain Bolt make their way from the center stage. This is at uh, South African races. Bolt once claimed to be faster than a horse. Al Sisi tweeted this photograph of himself as he visited Oman. Nigerian oil shares up 16.73% year to date. The Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index is up 22% year to date. The US dollar has reached 42 on Sudan's parallel market. Gathara says the media crackdown only helped turn the story from the polarization within NASA and towards the administration's aversion to the media and its fear of public dissent. He's correct. Co-leader's absence punctures NASA post-oath agenda. The fact that Musioko Mudavadi and Watamula do not turn up not only politically terminates them, and in fact they were damned if they turned up and damned if they didn't. It was a trap. Opinion divided on possibility of Reiner arrest. This is a really a bad idea. He is seriously wanting such an outcome. Kenya is about faced fear for democracy as dissent is muzzled. This is a new crisis for democracies, Willy Matunga. Defying a court order, subverting the court rule of law. Uh, Amadasia, Kenya hasn't seen anything like this before. This is unheard of. When there is a court order, you don't obey, you look like a rogue state. Police arrested the third legislator over opposition leaders swearing in. So it's a fluid situation. I think the government's sledgehammer approach is not the right one. Kenya's tea earnings rose to 129 billion shillings last year, buoyed by higher prices at the Mombasa auction. The outcome is positioned T as Kenya's second foreign earner after diaspora remittances. Kenya shilling 101.795, Nairobi all share up 6.13% year to date and at an all time record high. This is the controlled control center of NTV Kenya, one of the TV stations which has been closed down. This is a photograph of David Yarrow of the majestic elephants of the Sava. The NAC 20s up 1.25% year to date. If you are eating whole fish in a restaurant or hotel in Nairobi, chances are it's from China or a fish pond, says the East African. I prefer my fish from the sea. And this is a photograph of Juma, who caught some white snapper for us in the Indian Ocean, and which we cooked pretty soon after. Once again, thank you for stopping by.